I'm pleased to say that today is supported by IE University School of Architecture and Design. They share our passion for making sustainable and equitable future places. Um, and they offer an amazing hybrid courses that you can do from anywhere uh, with some amazing class trips. So I'm, I'm going to invite the Dean of the School of Architecture um, to join me on the stage now, Martha. So uh, Martha, it'd be really good to, to hear from you. We're hosting this talk a few days before International Women's Day. You and I have worked together on, on many initiatives in the past to encourage more women into the built environment. And I, I know you were also at the center of the initiative to expand the definition of the Pritzker Prize to include the recognition of collaboration and couples. Um, so I, I would really like to hear from you about some of the work you're doing at IE University to encourage women into the profession and around your perspective about uh, women's role in, in the built environment in general. Thanks so much, Christine. It's really nice to see you again. And, and what a special day to hear Natalie DeVries. It's going to be great. A absolutely. At IE School of Architecture and Design, we believe in diversity. We believe in multiple voices and different points of view. And of course, women lend a lot to that debate and discussions that we can have. I I'm pleased to say that in the fields of architecture and design, our faculty and student ratios are really, really good. We have lots of talented women as students and faculty members making really good contributions to the educational experience. In the field of real estate, it's surprising because the faculty uh, ratio in terms of gender parity is good but still we don't have as many women students as we would like in real estate. And I think it's fitting as we're looking to this month celebrating women and their talent. Um, it's a good opportunity to encourage women to think about real estate and the many roles that they could fulfill in that field as, as a career path. And you and I have talked about why women are not so much in real estate. Well, I, I think it has to do with historical reasons. It has to do that with the fact that real estate was often seen as bricks and mortar. On the other hand, I'm really pleased to say that it's changing. Real estate is now being seen much more as city making. It has, there are many roles from public sector to private sector, from investment development, to creating uh, um, spaces for people through community development and other actions. I, I think there's a broad range of, of positions for all people and uh, ones that could be very attractive uh, to our women students upon graduation. So if I could just mention, we do have two real estate master's programs. One, as you mentioned, is part-time. People can continue to work. Uh, and study or they have if they have family or personal obligations they can study part-time over 15 months uh, unfortunately it's on Saturday when the class time the remote class time uh, takes place on the other hand it's it's a great opportunity to connect with people from all over the world and our top-notch faculty there are residential periods in Madrid and also in Mexico and at um, an urban futures conference uh, for the part-time program. And our full-time program, which also starts in October, um, is a little bit shorter. It goes October through July. And we look forward to welcoming people in Madrid for um, a face-to-face -face experience, or if COVID prevents us from always being together, we have a, a, a very flexible hybrid model. So we're ready for any eventuality that may occur in the future. Martha, if they want more information, where should they go or what, what should they do? Well, we will put in the chat the address. We have um, Eugenia Bolman, who is an admissions advisor. And we also have Victor Alanyard, who is also helps with career paths. 
And one more thing I should mention, Christine, because we are devoted to women in all phases and we know that different moments in life require different types of support, we do have three women's scholarships. And so I encourage people to speak with Eugenia or Victor because there's a, a scholarship with a mentorship program. There's a scholarship directly targeted to women to enter real estate. And then there's one for the whole university, which is a high impact or high potential award. And for this, you just have to be outstanding in any field, but I'm sure that there are many women who want to become uh, even more outstanding in the field of real estate development. Martha, I, I, I want to bring you back afterwards to have some reflections. I know how much you're looking forward to Natalie's talk as much as I am. Uh, do you think we need more women in real estate to shape our cities? Do you see that impact on our built environment? A absolutely. I think diversity uh, of any sort uh, is the path when we have more voices. And I'm sure Natalie will talk about this in terms of architecture and her role in the city when we believe that the way forward is richer, more consistent, more democratic, when it is open to many voices, um, then and, and those voices express lots of concerns about sustainability, about new ways of living, about needs of a broad population. So we definitely need more women in real estate, probably in many fields. On the other hand, I think we're at a really good time where there is a transformation going on in real estate in cities, so it's a perfect time to study and jump into the pond. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for supporting this event. And I'm going to send you down the magic slide back to the audience, and you'll be joining us later, so give away. Great. great. <laughs> See you later. Bye. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Natalie DeVries, oh. co-founder and principal architect and urban designer at MVRDV, um, a studio that works at the intersection of architecture and urbanism. They're known for their innovative and experimental work. DeVries was also recently appointed city architect of Groningen. So please give an emoji round of applause to Natalie. Natalie, come back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, that was a lot of uh, inspirational talk about uh, about women in the field. And um, yeah, today I'm talking to you from Groningen, indeed, as uh, in my role as city architect here. We have fortunately a lot of female colleagues as well, so uh, things are going all right here. But they can always go better. They always, always can be better, of course. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me the, the stage and... Um, being able to give this lecture uh, to you today uh, from uh, from at least two of my uh, positions. And I will start to share the screen. Is that OK? Uh, Brilliant. Yeah, go for it. We can't wait. Um, okay. I'll, I'll just stick around yeah. until I know your slides are up, and then I will vanish and return for the Q&A. Yeah. So Christine, tell me, do you see my first slide now? Audience, can you see it? Everything? Yeah. I am. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm seeing my screen now. So uh, yeah, I just have one question. Do you see my mouse as well? If I if I move it. Yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't see. Think I see your. I don't see your mouse. Okay. But maybe somebody. Well, I just have to uh, explain as as, okay. as as good as possible. Thank you. Okay. Great. I'll well, see you afterwards. Thank... I'll see you afterwards. Uh, so hello everybody and uh, looking forward to hear your comments afterwards. So um, I, uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, resilient communities and of course uh, the, the, the motto of the, of the whole festival is of course shaping better places. And I have a, I have a motto uh, in, in design which is um, that in order to make uh, our, our built environment more livable, transformable and resilient, we need to create spatial designs that are also more productive and multiple. What that is, I'd like to show you uh, on, on different scales today because I, I work on different scales and that's something I like very much and sometimes also from different positions. I want to show you uh, on three different scales projects that I made, uh, that we made as MVRDV, uh, buildings, uh, the neighborhood scale and a plan for a metropolitan uh, region. And uh, I will end with uh, my most recent uh, uh, position uh, as an uh, independent advisor, city architect of, uh, of the city of Groningen in the Netherlands. And I always nowadays start my, my lectures with two images. One is 
we are in the middle of a very big transition, which is caused, of course, by the digitalization of our society. And it has an impact on everything we do, how we work, how we work together. Uh, but it also gives tremendous opportunities for designers to start to use this uh, in their work. Uh, on the other hand, it also takes good, you have to take good care of what your position is in, uh, in, the, in the new networks that are arising. And secondly, of course, everybody in this audience probably knows this, uh, as, uh, as spatial designers uh, and working in the built environment and the bricks and mortars, uh, we have a huge impact on the environment because uh, although cities uh, uh, occupy only 2% of the total land, uh, the impact on the economy is huge, 70% global energy production, uh, consumption, sorry, consumption, of, if only it were production, <laughs> uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, producing of waste. So what we do, what we design, what we decide uh, matters. Uh, yeah, and like in the introduction uh, is also said, it's important that we do that with a div diverse community. Also inside our office, we have... Uh, Many, many people working on the projects that I'm showing you. So they're absolutely not my uh, personal uh, um, uh, thing. Uh, I've, we've done it together with, uh, with people like these here, a very mixed community, diverse community from our offices in Rotterdam, Shanghai, Paris, and Berlin. Um, yeah, so I thought let's start with, the, with some buildings and how they can impact uh, the environment. Uh, uh, of course, public buildings, uh, very important. And I would like to share with you uh, a design uh, made together with ADEPT Architects in, in Fredericksburg, which is a community inside the city of Copenhagen that had this wonderful idea of, uh, of in their neighborhood that uh, was in transformation and a lot of, lot of new buildings, new houses were made in an old neighborhood to also start to build a community center. But the fantastic thing about this community center is that it's not just a community center, but it also takes care of body, uh, body and mind in many ways. And we developed a, a concept here uh, that integrated all these different uh, functions that it can have. Here you can see it's positioned between the old and the new uh, parts of Fredericksburg, but also uh, adjoined with a wonderful uh, uh, garden uh, on top of a car park. Uh, so that you can also uh, enjoy the community uh, outside. And um, what was important in this design is, is uh, already uh, this, this multitude or this multiplicity, as I call it, uh, because it's a building that has many functions, but a lot of them can have double or triple use. So you have individual areas in the building, but the whole building in the weekend, for example, also doubles as a huge playground, which is important in. Copenhagen, where it can be cold uh, and dark. So the whole layout and design is, is catered towards, uh, towards this, this double, double uh, use. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's not something which is always automatically in the brief. It is also the way how, as an architect, you can organize your space. And I think it's a wonderful uh, tradition that is now arising in Denmark that they create these new community centers again, where you can meet, where you can learn, where you can have a startup uh, workplace, uh, but where you also learn uh, to cook together and how to, uh, yeah, how to have a healthy life. And, uh, and this Scandinavian tradition, I, I wish we could also copy in many places, for example, in the Netherlands or in, in Groningen, uh, where I am currently. But you might say, well, that's a public building and there's public interest and, and public funding, although there are also yoga classes and private entrepreneur in this, in this neighborhood center. What about when you start to build, uh, let's say, a completely privately developed building? Uh, in this case, we made a, a, a co-working office in the, in, right in the center of a Polish town called Wroclaw. And that's where we start to talk and this, this, uh, this developer, this, this entrepreneur also uh, had it uh, high on the list, uh, if we uh, occupy such a central place, maybe uh, as a private company, you can also give back to, uh, to the city. And uh, so the whole um, building, which is partly uh, uh, using uh, existing ruined facades that were still on the site uh, and integrated that in the new building, 
uh, gives a fantastic roof terrace, uh, adds uh, uh, art uh, to its uh, to its restaurants and meeting places, and uh, yeah, makes makes the whole environment more active and uh, and accessible. So this is a building, although it's private, that completely let's say opens up its 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 lower floors and its top parts. It acts as a beacon of light uh, in the evening. Uh, making it a nicer and safer place to go. And uh, uh, who, would thought, who would think that a co-working office can be a, can be a great place to, to go? And so it's not just the public sector, but also the private sector. And with us, uh, with the help of architects that can help to, to create these kinds of uh, spaces. Um, yeah, and wonderful is, I think, in all cases and in many projects, also always the, the, the collaboration with, with local or she's, she's national known artists uh, uh, who made the fantastic murals about uh, reflecting history of Rochlaw, uh, Alicia Biala, who greatly uh, contributes to this, uh, to this space and that indeed it is a, it is a beacon. Uh, uh, so very interesting to think of buildings. Uh, even if they're not publicly accessible, if you can somehow negotiate accessibility on rooftops and uh, and the plinths of uh, of buildings, and then and then you can work together really greatly. Uh, on the neighborhood scale, uh, we also design with quite a particular uh, attitude. We now go to Brittany in France, and uh, this is uh, this is a project uh, of of housing surrounding a nice uh, cafe and on a uh, on a historical spot um, uh, of, of, a, of an old tax uh, office therefore the word octroi, uh, octroi. <laughs> and uh, yeah so this is actually of course a kind of uh, uh, regeneration uh, project uh, uh, structuring uh, uh, a place that was formerly not used for housing and uh, you can see here also what kind of dialogues we then have with the community, in this case, in the competition, with the politicians and the, and the jury. Uh, we always show what we at least should do in the volumetry, but then we say, well, how can we make this place truly interactive and porous because it's such a nice site. It's, it would be a pity if it doesn't open up more to, to the context. And if it's, if, it's, if it's not acting like a wall, but more like small, small landscapes uh, landscapes and and in that way we can even give more people in the building and uh, around the buildings views and uh, and terraces and and then literally yeah, as a fourth step for everyone and wouldn't it be nice if we then also really green those uh, those terraces to emphasize its uh, its organicness uh, uh, even more and then in the next step we also added uh, a section uh, cross sections through the building opening up so we're able to walk and see through the building and we're currently talking to artists again to to create public lobbies uh, inside uh, the building as well uh, to 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 really make it interact with its environment uh, very well cars are parked underneath uh, a landscape uh, is made the, the 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 waterfront is made more accessible and uh, by introducing these big hallways uh, in the in the little image I always know that uh, even though it's in, uh, not, it wasn't in the program, that these will be places where people can meet and potentially even uh, organize uh, events together with, with, the, with the other inhabitants in the building. You have already, let's say, a festive space for that or, or a space to, to, to hang, hang around. And, and uh, fortunately, it's, it's very mixed and diverse. Uh, through the through the through the local regulations, the, the municipality made sure that on such a prominent spot near the city center of of Rennes, uh, uh, the community that will be living here is is really mixed. It's really a mixture of all kinds of affordabilities, uh, and it also includes a part that is super uh, uh, super sense, sense, um, uh, re, um, sustainable in passive house uh, style. Uh, if only it could be the complete project, but well, that was probably the reality in 2018 out there. Uh, but we've learned a lot enough to, to do more and bigger projects uh, uh, this way. Uh, yeah, and we, we really wanted to give this whole building this atmosphere of a ensemble. 
and like uh, like I said, we wanted to green uh, the terraces so everybody gets their own pots and uh, water taps uh, on their balconies to make sure uh, that these plants uh, can be maintained uh, uh, as well. And uh, we'll be greening some uh, some collective roofs uh, as well. And here you see the effect of one of the porosities, as the French call it, the porosité. Uh, uh, entrances that double as as meeting spaces and and of course some some uh, commercial functions uh, retail functions at the at the bottom uh, as well and uh, like in 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 our other buildings uh, how can we also make build uh, a socially safe place by uh, creating also beacons uh, and and light uh, in the public space uh, in the evening and uh, fortunately it's under construction so uh, the proof will be in the pudding, of course. Um, continuing with uh, neighborhoods um, in, a, in a city in, uh, in Eindhoven. Uh, again, a sort of densification of an even larger uh, scale. It's something we do very much with our office is that we use data and, and, uh, and uh, urban information to optimize uh, our densification strategies. Uh, yes, sometimes uh, new and unique shapes are, are emerging from our urban uh, ambitions, like in the previous scheme as well. And in this case, uh, optimizing uh, uh, the amount of square meters that we can build without uh, compromising the quality in the streets meant that we created this rather uh, specific uh, uh, shapes for housing. And, uh, but in an interesting way, it also fits uh, some of the existing buildings in yellow that are already on the, on the site uh, from, uh, from, from, from the post-war era, sort of uh, classic modernism. And, um, uh, and you will see that we can also use these roofs. We can use these roofs to make more apartments with nice, uh, nice balconies, but we can also use it to green the roofs and to create some fantastic rooftop uh, spaces <clears throat> for the inhabitants uh, uh, to use. Uh, again, here the car is, is removed from the street. It's it's below in in car parks, and um, yeah, the different positioning of the building allows us to make different types of of, of collective spaces. Uh, make we make sure that it's being greened as well because that's that's important too, and uh, it is important to. To, to deliver also a diversity of, of outdoor spaces, I think, when you create a new neighborhood. Eh? Like we, we like to position our buildings in such a way that, they, that we make sort of semi-courtyards, uh, smaller and, 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 and wider uh, shared uh, spaces, and even bring that up into the buildings. And here, uh, yeah, you also start to see, of course, that the new reality is, fortunately, and in the Netherlands we are emerging fast in this direction is that we try every possible thing to integrate uh, sensitive, sensible uh, uh, elements in the schemes regarding water and, and energy uh, collection and, uh, and green and good uh, building. Um, yeah, like I said, a, a view of this, uh, of this, of this uh, collective spaces we are making uh, as much as possible in spaces. Uh, uh, in, in, in our projects, whether on demand or, uh, or uh, integrating them with, uh, with, with corridors and, uh, and entrances. Uh, because this is also a way how you can create community uh, to, to, to make spaces that, where things can be shared. And we notice fortunately more and more that, um, that there are amenities added to housing projects. It's not just an endless amount of repetitive houses, but that you also add, uh, add amenities uh, to the scheme that people can uh, use together. And I think the past months have learned us how valuable these kind of spaces close to home can also uh, be. Mm, I was imagining that I would be talking uh, for a large part also to a British uh, audience, so I couldn't resist adding an old scheme we once made about densification with townhouses in, uh, in an old town in the city of Leiden. And maybe it's nice today to articulate in particular what I never talk about. Uh, obviously, obviously, you see, we, we create blocks where back-to-back -back houses are built on top of a uh, half-hidden, uh, half uh, 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 where, where car park is hidden inside. Uh, but we also try to create different 
public spaces in the area. Uh, and I was actually uh, specifically having uh, kids in, uh, in the back of my mind. Now, this project was quite particular because people built in, in groups, but also uh, were able to individually tune their, uh, their houses. And even the uh, housing corporation uh, stepped in and also... So a very dense typology where you have close to your home patios and, uh, and sometimes uh, roof terraces. But also, uh, and this is one of the examples by another architect who did an infill in this, uh, in this house in a very basic, uh, basic way. Uh, but you also see here, uh, uh, the, the cars were taken out of the, out of the street and uh, the people were allowed to, uh, to co-create their uh, and select their own uh, infill for the streets. So um, they, they build it together with the people in the back of the block at the, and, and with their uh, neighbors across the street from the other block. They also created different uh, streets and I went there again. Uh, 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 two summers ago to see it after 10 years uh, of, uh, of building and uh, found luckily all these kids uh, hanging around and stuff. It was quite a hot day, but uh, uh, lots of signs uh, of, uh, of, uh, of using. And also for the, for the bigger kids, we created uh, next to, uh, you saw some big patch of water. We had this sort of hangout for the, for the, for the little bit older uh, kids that are sitting in the lawn on the lawn here and the smaller kids who have their own special play, playground as well that can also be uh, supervised by, by parents as they go there. So all of this uh, builds up, I think, to, uh, to, a good, uh, good, to a good neighborhood in my, uh, in my opinion. I keep on talking very fast because I have so much to show to you. Uh, on the large, very large metropolitan region scale, we participated uh, in, a, in a Resilient by Design uh, project in the United States. And after we finished our, our group work with uh, an international team, we teamed up again with, uh, with Dutch uh, firms, uh, Deltares, an independent water research, water and soil research center, uh, colleagues of One Architecture, mobility consultants of Gouder Pokoffing, and we were supported also by the... Uh, by the, by, uh, by the Dutch uh, state and local uh, uh, embassy to check again on what we thought was actually a very Dutch approach that could help. And we thought it would be a, nice to offer that as well to uh, California, to the, to the Bay Area. Um, the, the Resilient by Design challenge uh, was uh, two years ago in uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area, uh, Bay Area communities. And this is uh, just a, an image of many of the teams uh, that participated and the projects that they made. They were all sort of localized. We were working on different spots. But as a, as a collective, uh, as a Dutch collective, we'd like to think about the water on a bigger scale, <laughs> as you might maybe expect from Dutch people. And uh, started, of course, with the analysis of the urgency of, of what is happening in this region. And there are many more regions, I think, in the world that have to face quite complex uh, uh, climate change uh, developments, uh, floods and drought in, in California, but also a severe housing crisis. Uh, people stuck in cars uh, for many, many uh, hours because they have to commute. Uh, uh, also, again, because of high housing prices. And then there's, of course, your occasional disaster every now and then uh, that happens as well with, uh, with earthquakes and hurricanes and, and all these kind of things. Now, calmer image, the Netherlands, no hurricanes. We do have earthquakes, actually, in the area that I'm sitting in, but that's another uh, story. Uh, but uh, we thought we would like to bring uh, another scale, the regional scale, to the, to the table uh, and, uh, and framed, um, framed actually many of the problems as a combination of too little and too much. Uh, too much water, too little water sometimes, uh, rapid urban growth, uh, all the risks I was just pointing out to you, and, uh, to you all and, and identified them for the whole area and try to explain how everything is connected to everything. And, uh, how a simple solution in one neighborhood, uh, yeah, might be a, an answer 
uh, beginning of an answer, but it's no, by no means you should uh, connect everything as much as possible on a, on a larger scale. Uh, so this is just an inventorization. Uh, it looks dramatic and it is dramatic of all the topics that this region is uh, facing. And what we like to do also is mapping and diagramming uh, and visualize uh, what, we, uh, what we see. So all these uh, aspects of too much and too little, we, we identify together uh, uh, with our team. I'm not gonna read out all these images, but you can sort of imagine looking at all these images of uh, uh, fragmented policy making, increase in sea level rise, uh, problems of, uh, of commuting and, and systems around the bay of traffic. Uh, and I've been mentioning uh, uh, endlessly repeating bad solutions, uh, planning up uphill, but thereby uh, increasing problems sometimes. And we also said, well, we are a collective working together. Uh, we are organizations of uh, experts, designers. We want to collaborate with you on a municipal scale, but maybe also on a regional scale, because the tools we have to develop are are systematic uh, tools that we need. Um, water management, area development, in inclusive design, uh, sustainable uh, mobility, and they all have to work together in a systematic way to be able to deal with this, uh, this topic. So the topics themselves are huge, but if all these small policy making things are integrated and working together, you can actually form a really resilient way of working. Uh, and all the things added up uh, form fantastic systems that might make the whole area more uh, more resilient. Eh? So, um, but you have to know how to how to integrate all these things together. Yes. So, as Dutch, we were thinking big on a on a, on a larger scale, on the regional uh, scales, and and there are things you can only do if you work on that scale, like. Uh, uh, preventing everybody from getting uh, uh, wet feet. But you also have to implement them on a, on a small scale. Everybody knows the example of the Dutch guy who puts his finger in the dark because one little hole can make the whole country flood. So that means that also all the different elements in the network should be working together. Huh? And each, if each initiative, uh, individual initiative follows at this guideline together, you can form a very strong uh, networks for for resilience so um, it ended in a, in some recommendations um, and we have an international water ambassador Hank Oving that is also showing this as an example worldwide not just for this area so yeah advice update all the plans uh, with water uh, and and climate adaptations yeah, we need this you need this on a, on a large scale to have these visions we do this in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we also said maybe there should be one commissioner, not a politician, but an independent figure who is just concerned about solving the problems of resiliency. Don't make it politic, political. Uh, you need long-term breath and long-term budgets to solve your problems. Uh, we talked about digitalization. Make sure you have monitoring systems. Uh, uh, in place. This is just a website on the under urban groundwater network of, of Amsterdam and of the Netherlands. Uh, develop collective design principles. Uh, we should join forces together. Now, as people working in cities, you know, of course, what the good impact of collective visions on design principles uh, can be. And uh, you can start bottom up and top down and bring all this together. And that's a great, uh, a great way to uh, to do it and to achieve it. And you need both. And then uh, you can create a truly uh, resilient uh, environment. Now, I am not a commissioner and, and this is all the numbers that are also part of this uh, positive outcomes that we could uh, achieve when, uh, when, when you work in such a way. You can house more people, you can be more effective with water that now gets lost. Uh, you can change the modal shift so that you don't have less uh, transport problems, etc. So now I'm coming then to my uh, fourth scale, uh, the city. Uh, and I'm, I'm recently asked to become uh, independent advisor, city architect to the, to the city of Groningen. 
excellent, of course. It makes it possible for me to think and work and collaborate on the scale of a city, on on the subjects that we've been that I've been talking about already for 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 the past uh, thirty almost thirty minutes. And uh, I, I just started uh, first of January, but uh, you can imagine, of course, my fascination for this type of uh, job because I am now really at the forefront uh, of of a city that has many many projects running at the same time quite a progressive city uh, they have around 205 uh, inhabitants it's in the north where i was born also not far from this uh, from this city and i i grew up uh, it's the fifth municipality in the netherlands a lot of jobs students international students it's a very young city companies like to come here to to start uh, so uh, start up their, their firm. So far, the city marketing, you could say. To the right, you see uh, uh, the, 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 the city boundaries. It also includes two villages. It's a very diverse city, very old university city, very historical uh, development. But it also has universities, hospital, hospitals, uh, developments from every thinkable era uh, in architecture. And uh, it has a lot of ambitions as well. Uh, cities all having to do with the quality of life. They, they branded themselves the, 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 the next city. Yeah, it's about bicycle, green, sports, uh, diversity, uh, affordability, uh, etc., etc. But as a designer, of course, I, I also know how complicated and complex it is to bring all these things uh, uh, together and it also uh, asks for new visions on old topics yeah? so how do you make a, a, a centuries old square more more climate uh, resilient uh, fantastic that this city was already in the 70s uh, banned cars from its downtown but well yeah with all these people and bicycles how is that going to uh, develop and keep uh, keep lively uh, yeah, uh, great uh, station area is developed, uh, but we also need to add more uh, more housing uh, uh, to this area uh, now. It's political targets, build 20,000 houses, do it mostly inner city, uh, transform uh, uh, old neighborhoods, make sure that uh, nobody tries to rip off students all the time with bad uh, tiny apartments and, uh, and rooms. Uh, this is just the, all the renewal in the city. <laughs> I'm just giving my shopping list to you. How do you densify uh, in inner city old industrial uh, areas? Can you connect to the green and the water systems? Uh, it's all there. Uh, this is uh, they organize manifestations a lot. This city, so you might have a look. But it also is a is a city that we become wants to become CO2 neutral. So as discussions on where to put uh, solar parks and windmills. Uh, on top of uh, putting a lot of solar panels on roofs and behaving more energy uh, friendly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, 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 an enormous uh, uh, laboratory of uh, of a uh, of a sustainable uh, city. Uh, it's it, it's a city that scores very well on on a lot of lists uh, regarding uh, health and uh, friendliness and uh, sporty people. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, how does it stay that way also with all the uh, growth and, uh, and demands that the city has uh, as well? So there you see a little bit my challenge for the, for the coming years uh, as well, <laughs> apart from my own uh, projects. Right, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, this is, uh, this is what I can tell you so far. You. This, the sun has moved, so I'm a little bit shady. I'll have to... Just read yeah. us, but uh, really great. So great to hear from you. I'm going to bring Martha back as well to join us. But uh, you can see your round of emoji applause there. It's just so oh, lovely. Thank you. Too. Oh, so sweet. <laughs> thank you. Now I have so to do lovely. this, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Right. <laughs>